you know, when I was studying sustainability management at Columbia, what I learned really quickly was that there was this idea when I entered that sustainability was kind of a destination. Oh, we've arrived. We're sustainable now. And it's just, it's total bull. It's, it's not. I mean, sustainability is a process, right? So, so it's not like, oh, this city is sustainable now or this building is sustainable now. No, because you attempt something. You make a lead platinum building and then you observe and you learn and you increase the standard again to go further, right? You want to go from carbon neutral to carbon negative, you know? And, and so that journey is what people need to remember very often. I think in vertical farm, people have missed that. They, they just kind of see it as like, oh, we've arrived and this is it. It's constant improvement. And it, because it's improvement, that means that the method matters almost more than the kind of like final result. You have to have the method. And that's what I've tried to focus my practice on is, you know, what are the steps to ask the right questions and observe and focus your improvement on to, to get that process of sustainability constantly going. Henry Gordon Smith is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Henry is a sustainability strategist focused on urban agriculture, water issues, and emerging technologies. In 2011, Henry started exploring urban agriculture and launched the blog, Agritecture, to share case studies and analysis from around the world. In, two, in 2013, Henry co-founded the Association for Vertical Farming AVF and served on the board until 2017. In 2014, Henry responded to a global need for technology ag agnostic guidance on urban agriculture by launching the advisory firm Agritecture Consulting, which has now consulted on over 100 urban agriculture projects in over 20 countries. Agritecture Consulting primarily helps entrepreneurs with vertical farming feasibility studies, recruiting, and systems design. In 2018, Henry was voted top 10 in produce in the United States of America and 40 under 40 food policy influencers in New York City. In 2019, he was accepted as a Guelph University Food Policy Fellow and an advisor to the Ryson University Urban Agriculture and Food Security Curriculum Development Committee. Henry was named as top 20 influencers in food and agri agriculture by Rabble Bank in December 2019. He serves on the advisory board of numerous ag tech startups, including Smallhold and Foodshed.io. Henry serves on the board of directors of nonprofit food access organizations, Teens for Food Justice in New York City. Henry has spoken at numerous places on the topic of urban agriculture in four continents and has been interviewed about urban and vertical farming for the Wall Street Journal, Futurism, Men's Health, Bloomberg, The Atlantic, Arabian Business, CNBC, and I could go on and on and on. <laughs> Follow him, please, on social media because he is a fabulous man. Our paths have crossed many times. Welcome, Henry. It's so good to see you. Good to see you too, Mark. You did a good job with that long bio. I appreciate it. That's not easy every time, I bet. <laughs> no, it, it's not. But uh, you, I actually shortened it a bit because you, you've done so many, many things and you've been around the block and you've seen all sorts of things. I, I'm sure it's been a journey and a learning process for you as well, but uh, I, I could probably mention a lot more fabulous things that you've done for our world and for this industry. Well, thank you so much for the intro. I'm so excited to be here on this podcast. Uh, so yeah, let's get into it. Let's talk about urban agriculture, vertical farming. You bet. I, I, I want to start out, first of all, I mean, let my listeners know our paths have crossed at Skyberries, Seeds uh -huh. and Chips, and many other um, urban agriculture events, food events, um, innovative innovator events around the world. And um, it's been a sheer blessing to know you and have, have that rough connection um, with you as well. How have you weathered this whole pandemic time? This has been a crazy time, and I, I feel this may be gone similar to my experiences, but I would like to hear and let our listeners hear 
from you how it's gone. Yeah, so I mean, when COVID-19 started and it hit, I was on one of my typical business trips. In this case, I was in the Middle East. I was going to speak and we were also collaborating with the event, the Global Forum for Innovations in Agriculture, which is a large annual event that happens in Abu Dhabi. So, you know, essentially we got there and the trip, the, the, the event was canceled. Okay. And I had planned a, a little bit of a, an exploration of the region with a colleague of mine after that. And so the pandemic really began getting attention. This was March, probably March 3rd or 4th. So really when it, the, right before the lockdowns began. And so we decided to kind of continue on our trip because we were going to leave around March 14th to go back to the U S um, I was going to go to Australia to another conference. My colleague was going back to the U S so just, you know, crazy conference travel thing. So we tried to kind of relax and kind of get into it. And then the news kept getting worse. And then um, our flight back from Oman uh, got canceled. And so I had a difficult decision to make because I'm not a US citizen and there was some conflict with the airlines. They weren't sure if they were gonna let me on the flight with my visa. There was a lot of questions about who's allowed in. So I told my colleague, I said, you know, get out, get out on the next flight. So she booked a new flight, had to spend some money and Brianna got out. Meanwhile, I decided to stay in Oman thinking that, okay, in two weeks I'll get another flight and I'll just try to go to Europe, which is where my parents live. I'm half Czech, half British. I sound very American, but I'm not. So uh, two weeks go by and I have a flight booked um, and then it gets canceled. And then another two weeks go by and the next flight gets canceled. And so I'm in Muscat, Oman, staying on the couch of, of a business contact of mine and now dear friend, Majid uh, Al Masuri. And I'm sleeping on his couch and I'm 6'1". I can barely fit on the couch. I'm your tall guy too. So, you know, I'm, I'm there indoors, lockdown is going on, this whole craziness. And I kind of just realized that I'm stuck in Oman. And so essentially 123 days go by, 10 canceled flights. And it was crazy because that was the longest I had been in a location in five years that I'd just been in one place. And I started to realize that the travel was just out of control that I had before. I mean, it's difficult as a sustainability leader or someone who considers themselves one and wants to be one to travel and speak at conferences and weigh that challenge of, okay, this is the impact I'm making through travel, plus, but I also am inspiring people and educating people, which is a positive benefit. So I, I don't know, it's very hard to describe all the things I experienced in that period of time. I'm happy to answer more questions about it. But the first part was that travel just canceled immediately. And I had 65 flights last year. And now this year is a totally different situation. And I'm grateful for it, to be honest. I don't wanna travel as much as I did. And this virtual kind of phenomenon that's happening now or this renaissance is exciting because I can speak with you and, and many of the events have actually kind of pivoted and even some of our own events have found ways to connect people virtually. So I guess from the travel perspective, it's been a bit of a shock. Uh, the business perspective is another element that we can talk about, but that's really what I've been going through. And now I'm in Europe. It's just family is so important during these times of crisis. And so I've just decided to stay here and kind of hunker down here for the next little while. Well, I, I, I stalk you and follow you online, obviously, because uh, uh, your fingers on the pulse. I like to keep my finger on the pulse and know what's going on and follow those directions. During this time, I, I saw some, some digital pivots or transformations where you, you start putting a lot more content online and doing a lot more videos and things, uh, which was fabulous to see. But it was also, um, all, all your prior experience, and that might be hard for some people to read out. I didn't also go into all your degrees and your university affiliations and experiences there. But all that in some respects, especially around food and the type of uh, uh, food we focus on growing food and how, how that, that process is, um, really has a lot to do with sustainability and resilience. And so has any of that helped you to even weather it better? And then the client part of it, the, the business aspect of it, have people like said, man, we, we need to convert to this model, what you've been talking about for years. Uh, how can you help us? Let's get us there. Uh, can you give us maybe some insights in that respect? So yeah, a couple of things there. Uh, just on your first point, you know, it's very important for me as a consultant uh, to go out there and to speak at events and, and to get an audience because I'm trying to connect with people that want to plan farms or cities that want to strategize this. So when those events all canceled, that's a big business development loss for our company. So what we did is we said, okay, well, other people are experiencing this too. So we launched that digital conference series you mentioned, and we actually had 
five weeks, I think four weeks of consistent, of every day we released, every weekday, uh, business day we released a new episode. And so we gave people a voice and also gave others an opportunity to learn about us. And we did that all for free. And so there's like 45 videos on our website now still across the topic of sustainability and food that people can look at even today. And that was very rewarding and, and quite successful for us um, as a pivot, it took a lot of time, but it was also good to create that energy. On the next piece, you know, we've had two things happen since COVID-19 from the business perspective. You know, one of them is <clears throat> that, you know, we have a dramatic increase in leads, especially in the Middle East where there's been new incentives for food security as people have seen that the supply chain for food is really flawed and, and it's kind of fraying at the seams, especially in the face of COVID-19. You know, imagine that people can't get to work, they can't get to the farms, you've got migrant labor, it's a big part of agriculture, that affects it. You've got supply chain, additional costs, with food, with just protection and PPEs. So all of that has been very difficult for governments, especially in the Middle East. So they've created incentives. And so we get all these entrepreneurs and organizations who were never interested in food security before now contacting us and saying that. Um, with that said, most of them are not ready to spend. And even the governments have created these grants, but they're not deploying the money yet because they have their own cost issues. So while we have dramatically more leads and dramatically more traffic to our website, our conversion rate as a business has gone down. And so that's been very difficult for us and we've had to really adapt. How do we write our proposals? How do we give people value in the proposal request stage, but not have it cost us so much uh, time and money? And, and there's a lot of things we've done related to that, but it, we are encouraged by the fact that, that there is kind of this new understanding of how important it is to localize our food systems and just to understand where the risks are in that. And when these shocks happen in the system, we have to ask, us, ask ourselves, you know, how resilient is it? And, and what we do in urban agriculture, we believe that is going to make it you know, more resilient. And to your last point, sorry about adaptation. Oh no, you're fine, please. <laughs> I grew up around the world. So I think, yeah, the degrees is one part of it, but there's been many experiences through my life that have made me adaptable to something like COVID-19, I guess. So you know, um, my parents are very international. I was born in Hong Kong, grew up in Hong Kong, Tokyo, then Germany, Czech Republic, Russia. And in these places, sometimes they threw me into kind of public schools where I had to learn the language and a new culture. So, you know, there were different shocks like that. Um, I grew up Mormon. I had to go on a Mormon mission for two years. So I had to work with people of different cultures and people I'd never known before. I had to live with them and work with them every single day. And I had to meet new people every day. And then when I moved to New York, you know, I really started uh, from, from zero and had to really kind of work my way up in, in that big city. So there's a lot of different experiences um, you know, I didn't make it easy for me because I'm very social. So I think loneliness was the hardest part for it, for me. But, um, but yeah, I think everything in our lives in different ways has either prepared us or not prepared us for something like a pandemic. That, that's so wonderful to hear. There's so many things there that I could uh, unpack <laughs> and maybe we'll go down a couple little rabbit holes um, sure. as well. One, uh, I'm, I, I also used to be a uh, Mormon LDS. Uh, I went no on a way! I went on a mission as well. I went on Where'd my, you go? My mission was in Munich, Germany. So it was kind of crazy that uh, that's where I grew up as in, in Baden-Württemberg in Southern Germany. And so right. that's where my mission was as well. Also, where I went to, I went to Heidelberg. You know, yes, <laughs> unbelievable! It's crazy, but that that's that's neat. Uh, neat to hear as well. Yeah. But my my real first question is going along this whole guise of 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 what you kind of unpacked. Your, you are a global citizen, and and that is my, that that is my first question. Do you feel like a global citizen, and do you? How would you feel about a future without? borders, walls, divisions, limitations of humanity, one from each other. And um, then I, I, I want to, when you're done, so that we don't forget, I want to yeah. back into something that you mentioned in this global citizen and you kind of with a, the, in the UK had some experiences a lot in the U, Europe and what happened before the pandemic with this Brexit that has had a huge impact on food and some things that we've seen unfold there that I, I want to address as well. So your question, yes, I consider myself a global citizen. I mean, I, you know, most of my, so kind of up till 10 years old, I was in Southeast Asia, 10 until 18, I was in Europe. And then I've mostly been in North America. I kind of feel like Europe or maybe even the Middle East is my next chapter. So kind of every decade or so I go to a different place, but I still have, you know, a couple more decades to go to the rest of the world. So, you know, how global it is, I, 
I haven't actually been to Africa, for example, so I still have to get to that continent. But I'm certainly very, very honored and, and lucky to have the experiences I've had and, and have that global um, experience. I have three passports, so I'm pretty global in that sense as well. Um, borders or not? I mean, honestly, that's a difficult question. I, I definitely, because of the upbringing that I've had, I, I think most people who grow up in one place, I have a very open mind and I've learned that through a process of observation, you can really start to understand how people see the world and then you can connect with them no matter what their race is, no matter what their class is, no matter what you know, religion or place they come from. It's really about that, that process of awareness and that's kind of what my life journey is really about is, is can I become more aware? And I think that that's part of what global citizens kind of learn when they're young. So yeah, I mean, I suppose um, I, I would be totally happy if, 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 if there were no borders overall, but I think that we need to be a process for how people interact with each other from different cultures. I'm not so naive to say that there isn't culture shock. I experience culture shock. So whether it's people coming to my country or me having different people come to my country, there would need to be a process for that. And I think it's a very interesting question to ask, what are the policies that would make that possible? What are the kind of urban planning and education and economic uh, structures that would make that possible? And I don't have the answer to that now, we can talk about it. But I suppose in principle, um, I would like the world to be more connected, more integrated and more equal. So for me to say, no, we have to have borders forever, um, wouldn't really align with my values. The, this, um, and I'm, I'm kind of leading you in a direction with this question, <laughs> but, uh, but, and, and you know, I, I'm very transparent, so I'll reveal to you why there's no secrets here. But really, um, <clears throat> during the pandemic, one of the, the major things that we deal with every day is food. And it, it is a global citizen. It's all over. Mm -hmm. It's one that didn't get stopped at the borders. It continued to move for the most part uh, all, all around the world um, because it's an essential and um, it's also that way. But it's also our energy source. And so to have our energy source um, be a global citizen, so to say, but humans not, um, Mm -hmm. the, the, those are two systems that all, almost always don't seem to jive well together when you're blocking one thing, but the energy source of that human is something else. And that's maybe a whole nother discussion or debate where it ties to the Brexit. So there's been a lot of bad ci civil uh, frameworks in our world that are kind of unrest and bad decisions, bad players. Um, and there was this big push with the, the Brexit and, and the vote that uh, happened that had a strong play really around food and migrant workers going to the United Kingdom, taking jobs, but uh, in uh, well above 200,000, and I've heard numbers clear up to 600,000 some years that traveled to the United Kingdom to harvest, produce, and uh, create crops in the United Kingdom. Well, the Brexit kind of got rid of those migrant workers and then the pandemic, the lockdown occurred. So the, the first question would normally be, during that time, did all those U UK residents that voted on the Brexit, did they jump into those 200,000 plus jobs to harvest the food and produce the food? Did those jobs get filled and taken? And and is everybody happy? Well, you know the answer, you're shaking your head. The answer is no. <laughs> And then the second travesty that happened with food was that because they didn't have the workers, the harvesters, even though that vote was made, uh, what they were doing is they were tilling food back into the ground. So they were growing it and go to harvest. And instead of harvesting and producing it or, or transporting it, they were just tilling it under because they didn't have the labor to deal with it. So some of these political and, and things that, that have to do with geopolitics or globalization, uh, whether it's workers or however we see that aspect, are having some really negative consequences, but it's unique for us to see how they're so strongly tied to food. And uh, if you have any other specific issues maybe with your dealings, uh, over this time to, to comment on that because it wasn't just the United Kingdom, it was multi, multifaceted areas. And I'd just yeah. be interested in hearing your views or your thoughts. Well, I mean, I think one of the things I'd like to say is that, you know, it's, it, it's certainly not exclusive to the United Kingdom. When we look at our agricultural system as a whole, there 
is a huge number of migrant workers and, and a lot of women that are actually growing our food globally that we just need to recognize um, that, that they're doing that work. And without them doing that work for a lower cost, we certainly wouldn't be able to have the low um, cost of food that we do in the Western world. So if you look in somewhere like um, Vietnam, or if you look in somewhere like India, the percent that people pay for food relative to their total income is much higher than the percent that someone in, in, in the United States or the United Kingdom would pay. So we benefit from a cheaper total cost of food as our total um, budget as a result of them doing that work for us. And, and that's one of the multitude of paradoxes. But certainly if we look at, you know, there's me Mexican migrant workers that go to the United States and Canada. Most of the greenhouses in Canada are operated by migrant workers. In the Middle East, we have migrant workers from Bangladesh, from India, from Pakistan that are driving a lot of that. And all across the globe, um, they were kind of put on hold or sent home um, in, the, in the face of COVID-19. Now, in some ways, that's a good thing because the governments have had to recognize that this externality, as David Suzuki calls them, right? The externality of um, getting cheap labor and, and the other consequences of that, the risk related to that in this case, has not been accounted for. So whether it's uh, what's happening with Brexit and then learning, even though I think it's, a, it's ridiculous that the that, that United Kingdom is, is trying to exit the EU or it has done it, um, they are recognizing these risks uh, that they have in their system. Will they do a good job in solving it? I don't know. But that's the, that's the benefit of any time we experience a, let's say, a failure or a crisis in our personal lives or in our governments or in our, our globe, is we do have an opportunity to learn from it because we've identified a risk. So, you know, there's always that two sides to it. So I guess my point is it's global and that it's not necessarily only a bad thing because whether it's the governments back home that have to figure out how to deal with um, these laborers and how to integrate them to the economy or whether it's the countries that are benefiting from the migrant labor that have to learn how to be more independent and reduce that risk, there are some benefits to that. But it's too soon to say, and I'm, and I'm although I'm an opt, I'm an optimist, I'm a realist, I like to think optimistically, but I think I really do see things realistically. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not certain that we are going to learn from those lessons based on, on, on history. Yeah, they're definitely hard learning lessons. It's a hard way to, to have to learn it that way, but I, I think it is. And, and really, if they can come out of that lesson more resiliently and realize that almost like it's a vulnerability in their system, that there's some kind of a hole exactly. or, or something broken in the system, that, that that's a learning lesson that they can fix it and, and not repeat that mistake again. So I, I really like that. I'm going to hit you right off the bat with probably one of my hardest questions, period, so that we can get it out of the way and maybe deep dive. Let's do it. It's, it's the burning question, WTF, and it's not mm. the swear word. It's what's the future? Mm. Well, this is an exciting question. You know, one of the things that I first thought a lot about when COVID-19 hit was I remembered this uh, future of society workshop that I had done with an organization called Future IQ that does a lot of scenario analysis, imagining you know, what are possible futures for regions or countries. And it's a really exciting, interesting consulting firm, but I had the honor of being invited with 29 other experts. So the ex-mayor of Vienna was there, the head of government for KPMG was there, and it was in Windsor Castle. It was really exciting you know, in St. James's house, which is a kind of a thought, a, a, a you know, think tank space in Windsor Castle. So I go there and I'm excited to imagine the future of society. But when COVID-19 hit, I remembered what our conclusion was. So we kind of did an axis. So we imagined four possible scenarios that we had agreed upon. And we went through really interesting activities, including imagining the headlines between now, every five years until I think 2040 was our, was our, our last element. And I'll, I'll send you the documents. You can link to it in the podcast. Great. It's an interesting report. Perfect. So what we concluded, these 30 experts, was that the direction we're going, and this, this happened December 2018, the direction we're going, um, the most likely direction we think we're going is towards sort of what we called, um, you know, clusters, which is essentially these kind of, um, you know, guarded walled cities or, or communities. Think of a gated community, but the gated community inside of it has more than just a gym and a pool. It has the co-working space you need. It has actually a school where students go in and there's a caretaker, not necessarily a teacher, a caretaker, and then ex, you know, teachers are zoomed in virtually to the classroom and the parents feel safe because the kids are around 
their own culture, their own race maybe. Unfortunately, this is what we thought people would feel. And it, it was really in a response, we did talk about pandemics, but it was really in response to safety and also just the human need to be around the same kind of people that, that we, we, we do feel safer, um, almost inherently safer around people that look like us and, and behave in the same way as us. So it wasn't a more integrated society, which was one of the other scenarios we were mentioning. Um, we kind of went through a vote and we, we, most of us thought we were going there, but most of us wanted to go to a more integrated society. So we had to answer both questions. Where do we think we're going and where do we want to go? And um, I'll send the report, it was very interesting, but some of the headlines we were looking at was like first student graduates without ever attending school, you know, without ever going to a school classroom or, or going into a building. Um, you know, we, we, you know, these virtual jobs that where people are always at home uh, was a big part of it. R robots executing the services that they need. So, you know, robotics is getting a huge amount of attention now in the face of um, COVID-19. How can we reduce labor even further? And in my industry, in agriculture, and, and certainly the high-tech agriculture I work in, vertical farms and greenhouses, automation is a very expensive kind of, you know, extra that, that, you, that you had. Now it's a must-have. Right? So that's one of the big shifts that, that's happened as well. So what do I think is next? I mean, big, big question. I, I do think that we are going towards more clusters and pods in society. I think that this COVID-19 is not going to force us to integrate more. Um, I think it's going to, the, the rich are going to get richer through this experience. And, and there's a lot of evidence they already have. There's going to be more division as a result of this. Um, I think in some ways, overall kind of, impact on the environment might go down because if unfortunately more people are being pushed into poverty. So what's happening is, is, is as you get pushed into poverty, in, in many ways, your carbon footprint actually does go down. Um, so as we're, as we're having millions of people pushed into poverty from this economic slowdown, there could actually be a reduction in overall emissions as there's an increase in density, smaller homes, less consumption overall. Um, and, and that's a sad but, but potential consequence that we're seeing. I do think that travel will change a lot. Again, not so much for the rich. I mean, it'll change in a luxurious way. But I think, you know, I certainly am going to travel to much fewer events. And I'm excited that I have an excuse now to say, you know, I don't want to go, not just because it's not safe, but I think after this, this pandemic is done, I'm really going to be even more selective. I mean, 65 flights in a year was absurd. I mean, that, that's just, I should not have done that. And we, we committed agriculture to offset a percentage of our flights. So last year it was 60%, but still, you know, that's not enough. You need to kind of just reduce consumption. Um, other parts of the future that I imagine, I mean, agriculture will become more automated. Agriculture will go more indoors because the benefit of year round production um, also can sometimes reduce the need for migrant labor. It can localize that. You're going to see the UAE, Saudi Arabia, these countries are going to accelerate their potential to produce their own food very, very rapidly. It's, it's becoming a, a much more high priority for them. What else is there to talk about? I mean, so, so many things, obviously more digitization of everything. I don't know, I was talking last night at dinner, is virtual reality gonna have its moments? I don't know what you think about that, but my friend um, who runs fashion events, um, he, you know, they're, they're doing fashion shows now virtually. So when you buy the ticket, you also get the VR glasses. And I don't wow. mean the, I don't mean like the cheap ones. I mean, you're getting the, the really like, good ones. Yeah. So you're getting the ticket and that, and that's going to obviously drive the cost down of VR and the experiences become more normal for people. So I wonder, I wonder whether it's going to have its moment as a result of this. So, so many things to talk about. I mean, what do you yeah. think? <laughs> yeah, I, I really think that, so with the VR question that uh, we're already seeing just in our area, a, a lot of vertical farms and um, nurseries, that have already a walkthrough, a 3D walkthrough where you can use your own VR to kind of get the live feeling in, in, in the uh, greenhouse or the vertical farm um, yourself. Th that really leads me as well into some things that you touched, touched upon with, with uh, vertical farming, nurseries, um, and that there, has also been some trends and movements and I, I you're going to probably have to help me distinguish the two so there's the vertical farming association which you uh, you were on the board till 2017 and then there's agriculture consulting and and all the other many things and we're going to get into the super sure. new thing uh that uh, came out just recently that mm -hmm. i also 
was part of uh, winning a prize of which yes. I'm excited about. But uh, that there it really started out as as an open system. So it was either uh, agri uh, um, agriculture or uh, bright agri uh, uh, bright agritechs, mm -hmm. zip uh, zip lines or um, uh, kind of these open nursery platforms that there's been a little bit of a shift more to closed system controlled environmental agriculture, uh, CEA. And um, I believe also that you've been involved and in, in, in hopefully I'm not confusing it. Didn't you also do a workshop that was also very futuristic with the European Space Agency as yes. well for some, <laughs> some products growing, growing plants in outer space? So that's pretty futuristic, but, it, yes. but it's, it goes back to what we were talking about resilience, where you, you have to find a system that's highly efficient, uses resources, uh, only what you need, and that can survive in outer space. And, and uh, that is a closed environmental ag type of a, a system. So not only have you had the preparedness, but you've been involved in that. So I, I don't know if you want to touch on some of those already. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot. So hang uh, on. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to kind of give you a history of vertical farming 1.0 moving. I want to drink from the fire hose. <laughs> OK, OK, let's go for it. So. Um, you know, I, I, again, I started getting interested in this around 2010. And that's when I noticed that there was this gap where people were talking about community gardens, but they weren't talking about rooftop farms. And they were talking about vertical farms and greenhouses all differently. And agriculture is about integrating that discussion and saying, well, sometimes a vertical farm will make sense, but sometimes a greenhouse will make sense. And so we can't talk about one without talking about the other. And if we're gonna talk about them, we need to kind of think about a methodology of how do you answer that question. So it began as a blog. I was blogging about it. And one of the people I discovered in the early days was Dr. Dixon de Pommier. And Dr. Dixon de Pommier is a microbiologist professor at Columbia University, a professor emeritus. And he had published a book, I think in 2009, maybe 2008, um, called The Vertical Farm. And that launched the internet phenomenon of this modern era of vertical farming. There was even a vertical farm back in the, I think, World Fair 1950 or something like that, a very old World Fair, but that's the that's the, the, the history of it, the ancient history of it, let's say. But the modern one is that book launched all these people around the world asking this question. And the vertical farm, as Dr. De Pommier thought about it, was actually skyscraper kind of ecosystem. Imagine like a circular economy tower, right? These are skyscrapers that clean the air. They produce food. They've got renewable energy. Um, they've got robots as needed. And they're, they're also stunning, beautiful architectural pieces. And that was his vision for where cities could go and the potential for that. And he did some estimation of the yields and things like that, but there wasn't a, a concrete discussion of, is it economically feasible? Technically it was feasible because NASA was already growing indoors um, for space, space research. So there, even in the eighties, there's a lot of research you can look at for them growing potatoes and wheat, all kinds of things have been grown indoors even prior to this period. So, you know, I read that book and I thought, okay, well, I, I'm very inspired by this, but again, I see some of the same, I'm interested in seeing what's under the hood. Like, what would it cost? And how many people would work in it? And, you know, would that tower be competitive against a tower of Bank of America's offices, you know, in Manhattan? Would, would they compete? And so my pursuit was really about how can we make Dr. De Pommier's vision feasible, you know? And also there were other people around the world that were looking, that read his book and started vertical farms, like Green Spirit Farms, one of the old farms, farmed here. You, you know, back in the early days, you would meet entrepreneurs and say, oh, I read Dixon's book and start and raised some money and started a vertical farming company. But the vertical farms ended up looking like warehouses. So it's a warehouse, it's not a tower. Um, you know, most of them maybe could be three stories high, but most of them are around two stories high. Um, and that was the reality of, of what was happening. And so there started to be this kind of divide between the, I don't want to call it Dixon did hype because it, it was really visionary, but there was a lot of hype that spun out from that. People putting architects designing things that were not feasible. There was this dragonfly concept for New York, which is this enormous tower. And I started at agriculture, started digging deeper into it, running workshops, trying to get into the depth of it. Um, and, and estimating those costs. And I realized very quickly, it wasn't economically feasible for a vertical farm to be in Manhattan, for example, because agriculture, even in its most dense format of vertical farming, cannot compete with residential and commercial rental rates. So it does have a place in the city, but it doesn't have a place in the most 
you know, valuable parts of the city. And so Dixon actually became my mentor. I went to Columbia and we worked together. And I remember we designed a vertical farm for the Bronx. I, I created this course called Challenge in Vertical Farming. And my job was to take his vision and make it real. So I found a real site in the Bronx. I looked at the kind of zoning that a vertical farm would fit within. I designed it according to FAR, what was allowed legally. I thought about the community. I thought about the number of jobs. And that was my first really like feasible, feasibility study. And Dixon kept saying, make it bigger, make it taller. And I said, no, it's, you, we can't. It's not, it's not even allowed on the site to make it bigger in that way. Um, but on that journey, you know, I started connecting with this global community. One of them was Max Lulsol, who was also talking to Dixon. And he's the CEO of AgriLution. And Dixon said, you know, we need an, 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 an organization to kind of bring people together. And so with Max, we co-founded the Association for Vertical Farming. And that was a very exciting period of building up that organization and getting kind of global events and workshops. And we did so much work to standardize. There's a great glossary on their website. There's great visuals of how you understand vertical farming. But I had to resign because I faced the same problem is that you know, the companies in the Associated Vertical Farming were pushing vertical farming as the solution. There is no one size fits all. And for me, as a design thinking individual, I couldn't align myself with those values any longer. So I ran a workshop where I was teaching members about the differences between greenhouse and vertical and soil. And some of our members criticized me for that as a board member and saying, no, you should only be promoting vertical farming. And that just wasn't for me. So I resigned and I also realized in that process that to create a global kind of nonprofit is very difficult because agriculture is so contextual to your climate, your labor conditions, your policy. So that's when I started the NYC Agriculture Collective, which is a more regionally focused organization just on New York City. And I, I created an organization that has no membership fees. So you know, the ability to kind of collaborate and put sweat equity in was better and we were able to pass the first bill for urban agriculture as a result of our lobbying, which was very, very exciting. So I don't know if I covered everything you talked about, but um, you know, that's kind of the, the journey. And now we're, I would say we're past the hype stage and people are really asking the tougher questions. What I love now is that new entrants to the space aren't as naive as they were before. They can get more information online. They can, and that's really exciting because that's how we're gonna kind of leapfrog and get this technology as a real solution um, out there. And so that's really kind of what's, been going on with the journey. I don't know if I missed anything. I, 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 I agree with you. I don't think there's a, a silver bullet or magic bullet for, for all. It's not one size fits all. It's, a, it's very diverse. It needs to be di not only biodiverse, but it needs to be a diverse field for the location, for the situation, yeah. and be, be fit in precisely for that, um, that, that need and the situation to have it function. I, I actually want to emphasize that point again. Just, sorry, just one more time. Yeah, your audience is important. So, you know, when I was studying sustainability management at Columbia, what I learned really quickly was that there was this idea when I entered that sustainability was kind of a destination. Oh, we've arrived. We're sustainable now. And it's just, it's total bull. It's, it's not. I mean, sustainability is a process, right? So, so it's not like, oh, this city is sustainable now or this building is sustainable now. No, because you attempt something. You make a lead platinum building and then you observe and you learn and you increase the standard again to go further, right? You want to go from carbon neutral to carbon negative, you know? And, and so that journey is what people need to remember very often. I think in vertical farming, people have missed that. They, they just kind of see it as like, oh, we've arrived and this is it. It's constant improvement. And it, because it's improvement, that means that the method matters almost more than the kind of like final result. You have to have the method. And that's what I've tried to focus my practice on is, you know, what are the steps to ask the right questions and observe and focus your improvement on to, to get that process of sustainability constantly going. That's fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, in, in that, it leads nicely to really what I want to discuss. So, I, and I teased it a little bit. So you came out during the pandemic. Uh, you've been working on it, uh, I believe, from well before that. We, you'd kind of teased and said you're working on it. And I'd, <laughs> I, I, I joined the Slack group and the others and, and went into, you know, tw uh, t was following on Twitter and others about this. But it's Agritecture's uh, design program, which really can, you know, help you get the numbers, the true cost, uh, um, which is so needed, and especially for people who are who want to eventually leapfrog or who are starting out that have no clue, but need some good some good tools. Can you tell us a little bit more about that tool and 
and the evolution over the past little while and how, how the success is or what you're seeing? Yeah, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk about Agritecture Designer because it, it, it's really a big part of my DNA and my experience and what we've done as a company. So, you know, I talked about that vertical farm I designed for Dixon and, and it was so difficult. I literally had to go to different vendors to get quotes and then I would have to change my scenario, right? So if I would get a bunch of quotes, I'd say, actually, you know, I think I actually want to change to this crop. Now I have to get a whole new set of cro uh, quotes about the equipment and the costs. So, you know, that was like a six month study. And when I look at the entrepreneurs that I was working with on the consulting front, which we started our consulting business in 2014 and been doing it since then, you know, we've worked with hundreds of clients on answering their questions about how much is it going to cost, et cetera. And, you know, there's a constant process of iteration and experimentation with what it's going to be like. But the journey for them, if they don't work with us, we can typically design a vertical farm in about three to four months. If it's a, if it's a big one, maybe a little bit shorter if it's a smaller one to do it right, to make sure you reduce those costs and, and make sure you think about the sustainability questions. But if they were to do it on their own, it can be six to 12 months of attending events and researching online. And so two things for me, one, I said, okay, well, hundred is great, but I wanna make thousands. I wanna help hundreds of thousands of people globally do this, not hundreds. And so how do we do that? So what we did is we took our methodology and we took the data that we had learned about over the past 10 years, and we basically put it online. So Agriculture Designer basically allows you to input data like where is your, farm, what's the zip code, and it takes in global data on temperature and light. Um, you can input in your own labor costs, your own energy costs, water costs. You can input the kind of financing you're having, whether it's a loan or an investment. You can input the size of your farm. You can select, this is the first time online, you can go through a list of crops, okay, typical in urban farms, select them, and it'll actually give you the yield for it. So I can say my greenhouse is going to have 20% arugula, you know, 10% tomatoes and the rest of it's gonna be bok choy. And you can do all of that. And basically within minutes, you will get a 10 year economic projection for your greenhouse or vertical farm. We'll tell you how many people you're feeding. We'll break down the CapEx, how much is going towards lighting or equipment. We'll break down the OpEx, you get charts and pie charts that tell you that. And we'll tell you your payback. But what's great is that you can actually go back and do another one. So you can say, okay, well, what if I did a greenhouse instead of a vertical farm? Or what if I did a container vertical farm? Or what if I changed the percentages? Or what if I actually, maybe I'm looking at two markets? What if, what if I use the energy rates from this market? And so you can do your own scenarios super fast and get data based on the typical costs in this. You know, these are estimation numbers, but they are something that we take seriously and we have validated through our experience. And at the end, let's say you get to a couple models or one model you're really confident in, then you need to do some of the most important work, which is do your market research. So you may have input a price there, okay, I'm making X amount of dollars per pound for tomatoes, but you need to go to the market, which is what agriculture does on the consulting side. We're just giving you the power to do it. And you can take your phone and you have your market research tool on there. And so I can be looking at the tomatoes and I can say, okay, this tomato is organic. Um, it's packaged this way. Um, I'm gonna rate it you know, three out of five as far as quality. And this is the size it is. And so as you go through that, you can select the ones you want. It'll update the economics on your model. So you can refine your model based on what your customer is actually gonna pay for. And we're building a whole suite of other tools now. We already have a DLI calculator, a daily light integral calculator for, um, for greenhouses, but we're building an equipment marketplace. We're raising money for that right now. So after you've designed your model, you can actually order your equipment. And we're even thinking about bringing in like resources for grants or financing to take you really A to Z in this DIY way. Now you may need some consulting in addition to this, it depends how independent you are, but this is great if you're thinking about talking to your first investor, or if you're an architect and you're saying, okay, well, I wanna think what I could do with this rooftop, or you're a developer and you wanna ask, well, how much can I rent this for? Or if you're a city and you wanna run a competition, you wanna say, okay, all of you submit it through this software. So I'm really, really excited about it. Uh, we've been getting more and more users every month. And it's a very, very exciting thing that we've been getting feedback on and improving it. And so, you know, very, very excited about Agritecture Designer. And I'm sure you'll link to it in the podcast, but it's at design.agritecture.com. And I, I just really hope it's going to make things so much faster and cheaper so that anyone anywhere can take their ideas and, and get to the costs and, and, and refine them. So you, you had a little, uh, I don't know if it was a competition. It was more like a drawing on Twitter where yeah. uh, depending on yeah. how, how you post, uh, I, I, I won, uh, uh, won that. If you want to do something like that on this podcast, we'll say uh, whoever does the, the, uh, the uh, uh, 
gives a direct message to you or somehow either on Twitter or on one of the posts uh, that sure. you can maybe do a drawing if you wanted to incentivize our listeners to, to go in and check it out, try to get to use it. And I, I, would, I would encourage to look at it definitely because as far as the market's concerned, as far as the industry is concerned, you're the leader, you have the tools, you're providing the help, you, you've got the knowledge, you can not only do the consulting, but you've been around the block. I mean, it's not that, um, we could say, yeah, it's the hanging gardens of Babylon. I, I've, I'm come from four generations of uh, hydroculture nurseries in Germany, uh, Germany's largest hydroculture nurseries, um, which is, you know, the lava rocks and, and the different type of hydroculture that was done back then. But, um, you need to get that knowledge, that wisdom somewhere if you're not reading the book up or the plant factory or Dixon de Dispomiers or consulting with you. It's nice to have those tools to make your process, your journey a, a lot easier. Um, I want to kind of well, go let's, back. Let's do, yeah. let's do the contest. We can do it. Let's just do it. So, so we will do it. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you want, we can just say, shout it out. But like, let's say within a week of this podcast being published, you know, you can tweet at agr-designer. And actually, if you go to Des Agriculture Designer, you can, you can use the free part. So you can develop your vision, your first idea. Um, you just answer some questions, it's completely free. And then you can click share that. And when you share that, just tag Agriculture Designer and we'll give one lucky winner, you know, free access to the classes, which is the first part of the software. So I'll keep an eye on that and we can include that in the description. Why That's not? perfect. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll put it in the link and then uh, do exactly what I did on, on the show when we release it. You, you said a lot of things and we didn't really get to unpack them. So you discussed, uh, I'm a global food reformist. I'm also an advocate for the sustainable development goals. You've heard this probably from me and said it yourself. You, you said it at the beginning that um, one, we need a globally reformed food. Two, we need to empower women. Three, we need to empower Absolutely. girls. And, and, and a lot of people don't understand that. Women and girls, why do we need to empower them? Uh, they're the majority of farmers, food workers, food harvesters, food producers in our world. They're, it's not Farmer Joe in Germany or in Ohio. It's, um, it's the women and girls around the world who are sacrificing school education, and not only a fair wage, but that true environmental cost, this percentage of EBITDA, that envir total environmental cost of producing food that is not going into our food, which is disrupting our food systems. And so um, I, I really like that, that you mentioned that earlier, and I, I wanted to, to touch upon that as well, because a lot of what we do is not only educating people where our food comes from, how it's produced, what future methods of production are, but that, that whole education around how we can improve it and empower people to be stronger. On our journey of vertical farming, urban agriculture, um, nurseries and that, I, I've really been in, enthralled and excited about controlled environmental agriculture and even the progress of that. And, also the hype and what I have not seen, and I, I want to discuss with you about this, is there's high HVAC costs, there's high lighting costs, there's high energy costs, there's high water costs or uh, land and space costs, you know, especially you, you discuss New York. My God, the, the, the price of real estate, you know, then you have to charge 10, 10 bucks for a head of lettuce or, or whatever, just to break even, I guess. Um, well, that, that's not a good model. So how much are you seeing this trend uh, uh, or is there of, of close environmental agriculture or even vertical farms that are implementing 100% renewable energy, 100% battery backups, 100% water, full water management systems, not only gray water recycling, backwater turned into organic uh, fertilizer, using IMOs, indigenous uh, microorganisms as, as uh, nutrient film technologies, things like that. And also get rid of, getting rid of that high pink or colorish hue in the lighting spectrum and just throwing in a white that really doesn't make a lot of difference in, in how you view and keeping that system completely closed. 
taking away those aspects that would maybe reduce COGS, cost of goods sold, uh, and increase efficiencies, but also increase your margins so that you can say, hey, we can compete with China six, six cent head of lettuce. Yeah, so let's just talk about control environment agriculture for our audience, just those that might not know it. So it, it's kind of what it sounds like. You're basically creating a controlled environment, a sort of greenhouse or a box, a warehouse or a container, and you're going to create the technologies inside to control the environment the plant needs to perform its best. So, you know, there's, there's genetic modification. What we're doing here is we're trying to say, okay, this is like a plant going through like a gym. We're creating the right temperature. We're creating the right ventilation. We almost have it like hooked up to a sort of IV through hydroponic systems to get the nutrients it needs, but we're not actually manipulating the plant's um, genetic code. We're just trying to help it perform its best. And, and I think the first step in understanding this is we may think that a lot, I get a lot of critique, like it's unnatural, right? But I always tell people the same thing. Well, when was agriculture ever natural, right? You know, we have been engineering and organizing agriculture since the beginning of agriculture, right? So it's not that the engineering and the technology is bad in itself, but it's the questions you're asking, Mark, which is what is the cost and the consequence of that on the environment? Because in some places, you know, natural is not actually always the lowest carbon footprint away, and, and natural is also a very vague term. So, you know, we're trying to control that environment, but because of that, we have a lot of equipment. And so inherently there's a lot of embodied energy um, with that equipment relative to something outdoors. But when it is indoors, we also have other benefits on the operations side, which is that we can control the amount of water that's used. So one of the main benefits of controlled environment agriculture across the board is the water savings. And there's really not a lot of critique of that because you typically it's about minimum 70% if you use hydroponic methods, sometimes it's upwards of 90%. And there's a lot of different academic data you can look at and it does vary based on the region. But in our economic models and our planning, that's about the range that we see. So when we use 70% of the fresh water globally for agriculture, obviously a lot of that is for meat production. But, you know, we want to make sure that when we're growing other things that don't need that much water, um, you know, that we're not just irrigating outside and losing it. We want to recapture it. So I think that that is just a benefit that we can kind of agree upon. That's a main benefit of this. The other benefit is that we, we don't have to have as much pesticide use or no pesticide use because we're creating an enclosure that protects from the pests. So while there's an embodied energy cost that enclosure, we actually are getting the benefit of not having to spray with pesticides, which is a big environmental benefit because those issues, fertilizer, fertilizer and pesticides are causing ocean, ocean acidification, which is a big issue as well. But another cost on the environmental side is again, as you mentioned, when we try to control that climate, we have to use sophisticated climate control systems. Now in a greenhouse, let's say your greenhouse is in um, Abu Dhabi, okay? You're going to have enormous costs to power and cool that greenhouse in the winter or in the summer because you have so much humidity and so much heat. So while you're getting year round production through the greenhouse, it, co it comes at a cost. And that cost obviously translates to a carbon cost if the source of the energy is a carbon source. Now, if that greenhouse is somewhere else that's more seasonal, that may be reduced. If it's somewhere colder, you're gonna have increased costs in the winter, okay? Now vertical farms can, can exclude that entirely. So actually your HVAC costs can be more stabilized in a vertical farm in an extreme climate. But nonetheless, you have the lighting in a vertical farm that you don't have in a greenhouse, which is the point you were making. So in the lighting in that vertical farm, you have thousands of lights. I mean, you're talking about light, uh, like if this is the plant, light, light, light. So think about all that equipment and all the energy uh, related to that. So it really comes down to where is the source of the energy? And nine times out of 10, the source of the energy is dirty. And so vertical farming tends to have a higher carbon footprint globally in its current format than other methods of, methods of agriculture. The greenhouses do tend to have a lower carbon footprint. Now I will say it does depend where it is. My answer to this question comes from an analysis we did for Coca-Cola, which compared a greenhouse on the outskirts of New York to a vertical farm on the outskirts of New York to a, a, a traditional farm in California. And greenhouses were most of the time at the lowest carbon footprint, um, a bit lower, so I think it was about 20 to 30% lower than the, the soil-based agriculture. So not that dramatically. Life cycle analysis hasn't been done for these systems yet. So that's why we're talking about the process of sustainability. You can't label these farms as, as inherently sustainable because it's an evolving technology. And so until a full life cycle analysis is done of what the cost of those equipment are, the sources of the materials in it, we don't really know. 
but there also needs to be a life cycle analysis done for traditional farms, which is very complicated because how do you calculate, you know, the embodied energy in wells and irrigation systems and other elements like that. So there are some farms that are going renewable. Uh, Dream Harvest is a, is a vertical farm that use, uses renewable energy. You find in the US that most of them don't focus on it that much. Uh, some of the greenhouse companies like Gotham Greens and Lufa Farms um, do have a bit of a commitment towards it and that's great. But most of the vertical farms in the United States, the energy consumption is so high, they can't find an economic case to go renewable. In Europe, there's a lot of criticism of vertical farms because of the LED lights and their stricter commitment to sustainability. So you are seeing more of those farms, especially as it's a lot of retail deals. So retailers are building vertical farms in Europe. They have a lot of pressure from the consumer to make it renewable. And so they are kind of pushing the envelope with that, which, which I really like. And even more and more of the greenhouses in the Netherlands are going more renewable too. So Europe is a leader in, in kind of the use of controlled environment agriculture from a circular economy perspective. On your water question, um, you know, most farms, you know, vertical farms or greenhouses take water from the, the grid, from the, from the utility. I did see one, which is Urban Harvest based out of Belgium, and, and they've got a big focus in Brussels on the circular economy. That is the only vertical farming I've been to that, that captures rainwater. And most of them don't do it because they, they use so little water relative to their con, con, uh, your counterparts. But I really admire that, that, that these, these two entrepreneurs took the time to just capture rainwater and, and do that. Um, as far as, you know, kind of organics and, and that, there's, there's, a, there's a farm, there's very few of them, to be honest, Mark, but there's a farm in Florida called Three Boys Farm, and this is kind of the story of, of it. So it's kind of a hippie-run hydroponic greenhouse farm, you know, and, and it's awesome, and the product is great, but it was all organic, it was certified organic, and they had these big kind of compost tanks that they would make their own compost tea, and it was a pretty big facility, I mean, I think 10 greenhouses, um, quite large production. But you know, they had a really difficult time competing on the market because the certification for organic was taken away from hydroponic farms. And so if you don't have that additional certification value, and there's still a debate going on in the US and Europe, it's not a lot at all, then there's not really an incentive for the farmer that's using hydroponics to go organic and to use you know, more sustainable sources for those nutrients. And, and there is a fair critique that the, the nutrients used in hydroponic systems are for mine sources that we don't know you know, what the environmental impact of those is or who's working on them and are those laborers treated effectively. So there's a multitude of sustainability questions and potential critiques for CEA. What agriculture is doing to do that is we, we actually provide our clients with those answers even if they don't pay for it. So we, we try to, we can't force them to be sustainable if that makes sense, but we can at least be transparent with them about the carbon footprint or some of these decisions and let them know that this might not be a good sustainability decision or that it might be a PR issue or whatever to justify it for them. And we're trying to bring this into agriculture designer as well. So you'll get some metrics as you finish your design on, on some of those sustainability questions. But we have a long journey ahead. I do believe Cornell is engaged in a life cycle analysis comparing greenhouses, vertical farms, um, and soil based. So, so we will get there, but certainly you can't assume that these farms are sustainable and, and there's many areas across the board to do that. I mean, I would like to see, you know, human waste, you know, and animal waste used for the nutrients in these farms in the future. We have a long way to go before that's acceptable. Do you, um, <clears throat> I have a couple other um, <laughs> questions about um, in, in that direction. So uh, just in the past two years, there's been some, uh, some pop-ups of, of uh, some big movements in, in, in this arena, um, one of them being plenty. Uh, do you have any thoughts or feelings on how that's going and, and um, how that's actually impacted the entire industry and in, in, in the move? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I look, the, the, the big vertical farming companies and plenty being one of them, um, let me, let, me, let me just do a little bit of a history lesson. How about that? People need to know about that, yeah. So, um, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar, as the myth, and the Nebuchadnezzar, the, as the myth goes, his wife was kind of like, oh, the desert, it's so hot. I miss my, my home where I grew up, where there were gardens. And so King Nebuchadnezzar, as the king and this powerful man, built the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Now, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon 
might have been beautiful, but were they sustainable? You know, and, and what was the driver for that? Was it an aesthetic driver? What certainly was a sustainability driver to draw water from other places to the desert to build a garden for the king and his wife. So, you know, I'm not saying that Plenty and these other companies are the same way, but I think that there is kind of a, a phallic obsession for a lot of the, the CEO men in the space to change the world sustainability wise by building the biggest. And maybe I don't come from that world of finance where I'm just saying, let's raise hundreds of millions of dollars on an idea. But instead, I come from a world where it's like saying, let's take step by step and prove our way because that process of observation is so important. So I don't like the hype. And Plenty made a lot of dishonest claims at the beginning. I mean, his CEO, their CEO has been on stage talking about growing watermelons in their facility um, in completely indoors. And that's just not what's happening at a commercial level. And so, you know, I, I'm strongly opposed to hype and dishonesty in the context of sustainability. And I'm not saying that Plenty doesn't have a future because you know, Nate Story, for example, who, who, who is there, is a real scientist, a real experienced grower. And I hope that he can continue to drive biology and science in the organization. But we have seen a lot of hype in this industry that has gone up and failed. And that doesn't help the investors, it doesn't help the consumers, and it ends up having a lot of equipment, lights, plastic, um, that is sold on the market. And if you look at auction sales for these farms, you know, they're pretty ridiculous and how much money's lost and all that. So I am more of a step-by-step -step kind of guy. And I think that don't underestimate what the smaller companies that are going step-by-step -step can do to really impact food security and their communities and impact sustainability. So I like to kind of um, work through that hype. And I, I encourage everybody to ask the tougher questions about those companies. And there's a lot of emphasis on robotics and high tech and Silicon Valley and AI. And in the end, you know, it, it really is still farmers practicing agricultural science to produce a product at a low enough cost that the consumer can benefit from higher quality and lower impact on the environment. I mean, that's what it's about. And so everything else tends to be a bit of fluff. Um, I want, these are three questions that I have for you, but they're more like sustainable takeaways for our listeners. I, I want, uh, we have a lot of innovators and startups and people who are really interested in this space or they're, they're, they're trying to find themselves and they're saying, okay, yeah. well, I want to move in this direction. Uh, maybe is this something for me? What, what should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they are looking for ways to make a real impact? Yeah, so I mean, if you want to break into the industry, I really admire that in any industry in sustainability. You know, before I was interested in food, I was interested in water. And so I'll, I'll, t I'll just give some things from my journey and, and I'll give you three tips on what you need to do. So um, when I first identified that sustainability was what I was interested in, it was when I was doing an internship at the International Organization for Migration. I was looking at climate induced migration and that we're going to have 350 or more million refugees because of climate change by 2030. And that number was just so hard for me to digest. Um, how are we gonna deal with that? I mean, how are the, the issues between various countries gonna deal with that from an environmental security perspective? So I realized I need to find a gap. You know, sustainability entrepreneurship is like any business. You can choose, you can build a better wheel or you can build a better watch, but what's the gap you're filling? You know, what is the, the disruption you're making? And so you need to first observe and look around. So I actually started three blogs. I started a blog called Technology Water, which was about water and technology and news on that. I started a blog called Urban Layering, which was more conceptual about a new idea of density for cities. And I started Agritecture. And I would just research and blog these things. And this is the first step, which is the process of trial and error, where you wanna find a low cost way to test your ideas on the market. And social media is great for that. So I managed all three blogs and multitudes hire Agritecture Perform Better. Um, it was the combination of the name and the topic and the specific need that it was filling by providing that kind of agnostic spectrum wide understanding of urban agriculture. So I dropped the other two and focused on this one. Now you have to go into your, once you've done that stage, now you have to go into your three steps, okay? So step one is building your archive. So as I was blogging, I realized I was learning all these things, but you know, can I pull them out from my brain when I need them? No, nobody can store that much information. So I had to build an archive. So I built a Google sheet with key information. Plenty has raised this much money. Arrow Farms grow these crops. This company started this year, went out this year. Um, and I actually worked with Max a little bit on, on an archive with him as well. So you can find collaborators if you want. Uh, Dan Nelson is another guy who has a kind of ag tech archive that he's built. 
So this is really useful for you because if you're networking or if you're in an interview or if you're just talking about it, you, you have that available. Um, the second piece is hands-on experience, especially in agriculture. I, I think in other sectors you might not need as much, but hands-on experience always helps you. But until I had experience working on farms, the farmers didn't take me seriously. And so, you know, certainly other people weren't going to take me seriously as well. So you just volunteer. And, and, and honestly, you know, not everybody has the privilege to do that. But if you can find even just a few hours every week to work on a community garden, or I, what I did is I said, I'll do social media for free for you if you teach me hydroponics. That's kind of what I would do. And so I worked on hydroponic greenhouses and I worked on, um, you know, vertical farms and, and I worked a little bit on some community gardens as well. And that really helped me. So that's number two. And then number three is, is networking. Of course, you have to grow your network. You have to get referrals. You have to get, you know, because we've met at events and we've networked, you're inviting me to this. And now I've got this amazing audience. You need to do that for yourself. And the key tip for networking is, and my mom taught me this at an early age, is, you know, don't go to networking thinking what I need from that person, right? Like you go to an event, you're like, okay, oh my gosh, it's the, the CEO of Microsoft for this country. I need to talk to them. I, I, want, I want to get a job. I want to get a job. That's going to make you nervous. Instead, think about what you can do for them first, okay? Think of giving first before you take. And so for me, it was pretty easy because I just said, hey, I'm Henry, I'm an urban agriculture blogger. I'd love to interview you for my blog. And so now I'm creating value for them right away because I, people usually want to be promoted. And that's how I got to learn things and build my network and got known as somebody that does answer questions easily and help make introductions. And so those three are very important. And then there's one more, it's a bonus one, it's on the foundation. <laughs> it's, in, it's, in, it's on my LinkedIn, the article's called called I want, um, I want to be an agritech. And so the foundation is your brand. So, so you need to have a consistent message about who you are, what you do, right? And so, um, and, and so you, you know, Mark Buckley, yours is all about the SDGs globally and what you're doing in the space. That's very clear that you're an SDG guy and I, we like that. For me, I'm a kind of the communicator, blogger, consultant guy, but you need to have your thing at the beginning um, and you need to stick to that brand. And, and I recommend usually testing a brand for a minimum of three months before you make any pivot. It might not stick, but you need to kind of stick to it consistently for those returns to come. So those are my tips for breaking into sustainability or agriculture. That's fabulous. Thank you so much. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would love to have known from the start, from the beginning? Wow, so many things. Um, <laughs> you know, I think I knew it. Definitely, my mom is a, is a successful consultant and she's an HR director and um, emotional intelligence expert. So she really taught me so many things from an early age. But one thing she taught me is this doesn't matter about your technology or your brand or your business model. It's your team is the most important thing. Without a great team, you're, you're nothing. And so you need to retain your team and take care of them and create the culture that they, they feel excited about the work and the impact. And that's been super valuable to me. And so I, I kind of knew it, but I think it's like even more important than I thought it was. So just don't forget about that, that that's, that's something that you can never really sacrifice is, is making the work experience positive for everybody you're working with um, and, and that it's a great experience for all of them. Other things, I mean, you know, people say cash is, cash is king, you know, that cash flow is, is like your lifeblood. And it's so true. I mean, when you go through something like COVID-19, you really remember that. So, you know, if you're doing any kind of business, you have to really think about that cash flow and keeping it going because the act of going to raise money or finding other funding sources is very difficult when you don't have cash flow and, and just keeping your business going or growing is very difficult if you don't have cash flow. So it's a, a very important business aspect to keep in mind. Um, you know, what else? What else is a really good one? Um, I have got two other um, questions for you. If you, you okay, I let's think, let's go to the questions. Think, Those are my two. I think this is so we're, we're we we've gotten into a good flow, and I think uh, everyone has really gotten the message, and we've touched on that. Uh, um, what I really wanted to to get out because you you are a shining example and a leader in, in our industry, and have really done leaps and bounds for pushing this whole, uh, not only global food reform, but this industry forward really in a positive oh, way. Oh, thank and you, I, Mark. I thank you for it. So it, it's fabulous. I've, I've been stalking you and learning from you uh, uh, on the sides for a long time. Um, I, my last question for you is really, um, it, it's your personal answer, but it's really one 
on a worldwide basis. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? I think that, you know, the happiest moments in my life have been where I can see a path forward for my dreams. So I think that a world that works for everyone would be one where people's dreams can be connected to actionable next steps. And you still have to do the work to get there. But if you do the work, it's possible. You can get there. There are the, 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 the government infrastructure, the policies, the investment, the, the support, the, the, the resilience is all there for you to get there if you, have, if you put in the work. And I think that anybody that has a vision and is willing to put in the work and learn and do that work, that's the world I want, where they can get there. You know, if you don't have vision, then stay where you are. But if you've got dreams and vision, you should be able to get to your next step in the future you want. That's, that's what I think we all want. I, I agree. And I, I would probably even add a little bit of persistence. What, what you've shown over the years is a lot of persistence, not giving up, being in the right yeah. place, yeah. keeping the message going. I mean, we, we've probably forgotten more than we learned. Um, that's why it's also good, the, the takeaway that you gave that, you know, put that in a Google document, put it there somewhere because that's all vital information that you want to share with other people to empower. If you write a beautiful speech or you a poem or a song or you do a presentation or you create a super uh, um, uh, design tool that will change the industry or make people's lives easier, if no one hears about it, if you can't regurgitate or empower other people, it has no meaning. So thank you for your words of wisdom. I appreciate your time, Henry. It's so good to have you on the show. And if, if there's nothing else you want to add or ask me, then I, I'm done. I really appreciate your time and I hope we can do it again very soon. Well, thank you so much, Mark. It's, you know, we should talk more often, but I really appreciate you um, giving me the opportunity to be on your podcast. And thank you to all of you that have been listening. You know, if you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter, The Agritech or LinkedIn, or I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, you can track me down and contact me. You know, I, I, I get a lot of requests, but I'm committed to always getting you an answer. So even if it takes a while, I will always at least give you a response. So feel free to reach out and I wish you all the best in your journey. And thanks so much again, Mark. I really appreciate it. You, you better believe it. I'm so glad that you were on and I'll put all those links in the show notes. Great. Thanks. Thank you.